All right, welcome to Engineers for Communities. Today I've got a really exciting guest, Matthew Mendisco, Town Manager at Hayden. Over 15 years of experience managing special districts and different water sewer projects. Thanks for coming on the show today. Absolutely. So I want to jump right in. Kind of what are some of the top things regarding water sewer projects that you see like the biggest problems that are constantly needing to be addressed? So for smaller municipalities or smaller special districts in the water wastewater world, I think it comes down to funding <clears throat> to fund capital aging infrastructure because most of the time things were built. They operated for a lot of years without breaking. And then what starts to happen is those things start to get older, just like, you know, anything, any kind of infrastructure you have, just like your car, right? But after a while, oil changes aren't enough. And so things start to break. And that's where municipalities start to run into trouble because typically their fees are not sufficient where they're not building capital reserves, they're not building things because they're trying to keep their rates lower for their constituents. There's all kinds of income, social, economic issues there. And so they're trying to keep rates affordable. And that's what any water district municipality really is trying to do. They're trying to keep water, wastewater rates affordable because at the end of the day, there are utilities that I, as a homeowner, when I pay my water bill, I pay my gas bill, I pay all these right. things. So they're just trying to be, they're trying to keep things affordable with increasing costs every year going up every year. You know, everybody always talks about inflation and oh, well, inf when inflation goes down and everything else in the 15 plus years, I have rarely seen water waste or costs go down. Like <clears throat> the cost of concrete has always continued to go up. The cost of chemicals always going up. So all of these things are going up <clears throat> and it's that balance of staffing, capital investment, but then the daily operations. So what are... kind of hitting on that, the not building the capital reserves, is it, do you think it's like, cause you mentioned they want to keep it as low as possible, but I, I feel like they all know that these things are coming, but that they choose not to build the reserves. Is that a lack of foresight or like, how do, how do they usually tackle that problem? I think that sometimes it, it can be two things. In my experience as a consultant for 10 years and in the public sector for the last seven is, but in the public sector, I was doing kind of what I do right now. I was managing, I was advising and doing those sorts of things. And I think oftentimes it comes down to a lack of understanding of like, they understand what a reserve is. That's easy to understand the concept of a reserve, but it's understanding how much you need and associating the how much with their fees and connecting the two together with a line that shows their depreciation and their equipment costs, hitting a point where there's diminishing returns so that in water, wastewaters, like the return on investment that it's, it's so thin. And at the end of the day, water, wastewater districts need to have a little bit in reserve to <clears throat> make capital investments, but eventually the little bit is not enough because big things break. And so the first year I was at the town of Hayden, our clarifier, which was 30 years old, it's a water clarifier, takes the sediment out, right? You're an engineer, you know what that is. Takes the sediment out of the water. It collapsed and we lost 70% of it like that because it was a 30-year-old water baffle, old system. And one of our operators was showing me because they were cleaning it. And they were showing me, they're like, hey, do you want to come down here? So I was going to get on the ladder. And when I put one foot on that ladder to put weight on that baffle, the entire thing, except for basically 70% of it went to the bottom. Holy crap. Was that scary? Oh, yeah. Like, if they had not done the proper safety, I would have fallen like 20 feet with that ladder. But they tied off the ladder. They did what they were supposed to do. My ladder didn't fall. The section of stuff that was on my ladder didn't because the section of stuff where my ladder was fell 
that part collapsed. Oh. And then my ladder didn't move. It, it kind of swung in a little bit, but it wasn't a, a huge issue. One foot, that's all it took. Not even my whole body weight. And wow. so, and then when we got to looking, this is the first year I was here, by the way, like literally four months in. And we got to looking and it was like there was rusted metal and there was all this stuff. And I'm like, why is this in this condition? Like these things, this was just an accident waiting to happen. Well, it turns out, you know, um, it was just, they didn't have a capital improvement plan. The town didn't at that time. They didn't have this understanding of like aging infrastructure at that like it's okay to replace something even if it's not broken. Because as small municipalities, that's the other concept. It's typically, well, why would we replace it if it's not broken? It's still working. Yeah, that's a great point. That, and, that, uh... and, and you go, and, I, and when I told the council this happened, because then we had to operate our water treatment plant. We had to make water, right? We had to. And we figured out that we could just run our filters, our four filter system, that that happens after the clarifier. We just bypass the clarifier. We just run it, are straight into our filters. Probably took some life off those filters, oh, wow. but we had no choice. I mean, so you, had, you had a short term problem. You had to solve it. We had a short term problem, but that short term problem could have put our community in dire straits of no clean water. And so we had to. We were just lucky that the filters, the filter media had all just been redone. And so just like luck that those filters could handle. They were, yeah, in great yeah. condition. Right. And, and then we had to fix it within the next year. And we had to go get the money. We had to go do all of these other things and everything else. And then we had to fix it by the next April or else we would have been in, whew, right? And so yeah. there was just no concept of that like I understand things were old and things that up but when you look at it in totality that starts to tell you well the cost of this is x the cost of this is y the cost of this is b c d and, and then they look at the total and they go whoa we own that much in assets and you go yep i and just recently I, looked at a community that they got 80 miles of water and sewer two treatment plants and a couple prv vaults and i think 10 lift stations and they're like, there's no way that all costs like $340 million. And I'm like, no, it, I mean, you have 80 miles to mass, like, yes. And you need to be yeah. planning around those life cycles. So they're like, no one has longer than a 30 year planning horizon. I'm like, well, I would consider that to depreciate it over longer than that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. Our water treatment plant, we did a pretty decent overhaul over it, it in 20. Nine twenty. We finished. We started in 2019, and we finished in 2020. And and at that point in 2020, it was 40 years old. It was built in 1980. I was born in 1980, by the way. 43 years old. And it was built in 1980. So it was 40 years old. We did an what I've called an upgrade. We the clarifier was brand new, so that was good. But you know, all this other stuff, like the Clearwell and all these other things, these components of the operation. So we went in, I think it was like a $2 million upgrade. And $2 million in my, in our engineer's perspective and mine as well, bought us maybe 15 years before we would have to really replace the entire thing. And that was so hard for them to understand that $2 million only bought them 15 years. Maybe. And that was oh, only if the yeah. state regulations kind of maintained. Yeah, didn't change, didn't get more strict. Which... And if, and, or a little bit more strict. We could handle a little bit more. We just couldn't handle a lot. And, I mean, if it's a lot, then, you know, who knows, right? Right. Like, so I think that's the other part is that you get, you have to boards have to understand what the cost of replacement is, the life cycle is, and they have to understand that if they don't fix it now, even though it's working, but it's at its life expectancy, that when you do go to replace it, it's going to cost twice as much. 
Because if it breaks, it'll cost you probably double of what it, yeah. it would have cost if you would have just replaced it. So you mentioned like it's a very thin ROI and it sounds like you're trying to, you have a thin ROI and you're trying to thread the needle on this kind of long-term item. And you're trying to, you're trying to play this game of, I want it to almost break and replace it then, but not actually fully break on me. Well, but actually I think it, for us, that's not what we do. So when we did our CIP, most people will do a CIP and I've seen CIPs where like, the CIP, it has the piece of infrastructure and it has the, it has the, you know, the cost to replace it in that year. If you replace it today, right? But what if you, and then sometimes they're good enough to where it's like, well, I don't need to replace it today. So I think I need to replace it, I don't know, four years from now. Let's just say it's your chlorinator and you need to replace it. So I build in some inflation, but inflation, like the one thing that they don't take into consideration is the actual physical condition of the piece of equipment itself. They did not have someone come in, physically inspect it and go, yeah, it should last four years, but really it's only gonna last like one. And so your cost, you need to be thinking about replacing that within the next year. And so, the town of Hayden doesn't operate in a let it go to, we want to get full use of the part itself. So that's your maintenance programs, right? So along with the CIP, I cannot stress enough how important regular maintenance is. Something as simple as exercising valves. Oh my gosh, I can so relate. I have so many stories from non 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 just turned valves. You asked, so I this would be a great segue. You had mentioned operators. You see that as a big problem in the industry. Could you explain to me how that ties into this maintenance aspect of things either going right, going wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's it goes beyond operators because the operators operate the system most of the time they're focused on the plant of wherever that's at water wastewater doesn't matter what kind of operator you are maybe you're both town of hayden our operators in charge of both but mainly they're doing all the testing they're doing all the chemical testing they're doing all these things what they're not as aware of in my experience is the exercising the valve making sure that the water wastewater line gets jetted every year the TVing of the line every year that stuff is what actually ends up costing small municipalities the most money and it's that stuff that tends to get less value in cips and it's probably the single biggest long-term financial impact if you think about it over the long term with outside of yeah. replacing a plant would you say it's yeah. the board or can, if you have a council, city council, or town council, or is it the manager's fault? Who's the person that that oversees that besides maybe an engineer making a CIP? It depends on the structure you have. If you have professional management, it is 100% the manager's responsibility to ensure that those systems and whomever's hired to manage those systems, that all of that ultimately is, is happening. <clears throat> now, I think I have the fortunate experience to have been in charge of managing some water wastewater districts when I was doing special district work. So I have, I may or may not have a little more knowledge or a little less knowledge, who knows, about water wastewater systems and like their operations. Because in the private sector with special districts, when you get hired as private sector, they could fire the manager, get somebody else, whatever. They can do that in the public sector too, but like, I think it just, you have to become a, you know, as a manager, you have to understand the systems. I'm not saying I need an operator's license. I don't believe that's true, but I need to be able to know what the engineer is telling me. So when they say X, Y, and Z, doing the CIP or the operator says, hey, I have this problem, that problem, you kind of got to know what they're talking about. Yeah. 
you kind of it sounds like kind of like a business like right. you have to be like that ceo that can understand the marketing department the sales department the operation how it all city, ties city town managers special district managers are essentially ceos for hire they are ceos of that organization it's just public it's the only difference and to me it's the only difference and so i think because at the end of the in enterprise funds in governmental special districts doesn't matter we're all governmental entities they are business they are done in business accounting. So it's not some governmental accounting accrual thing. It is enterprise funds are done as a business account and the audit, that's what they're reflected as. So it's a it's a cash in, cash out type of thing. The last part that um, I think is important just from an operator perspective is just understanding that you gotta have that, you gotta have the whole picture. And I think that takes a manager as well as the operator and everything else to understand the whole picture. You gotta understand finance. You gotta understand a whole host of those things in order to be successful. So one of the things that I, I wanted to ask, so your operators are employees to the town. And I, as I've heard uh, from you is that they, you guys are very, very happy with the transition and, and the level of service you get. A lot of these rural districts have these co contractors that are hired on as the operators. I've never heard the same story. Um, I always hear these success stories from this, the salaried tenure. Can you kind of explain kind of your experience maybe in that area? So I think you can have success with a contractor. I do. I really do. But most of the time in my experience, it takes a secondary level of management above that contractor to ensure that the contractor is held accountable and that they're that things are followed up on and things like that in the transition to a public sector we have the same level of a public works director then we have our operators public works director is ensuring that all those operations happen and that everything's taken care of the operators are doing what they're supposed to do but the public works director also is like making sure that the lines are jetted, making sure all those other things so that operators can focus on their craft. Operators are operating the water and the wastewater plants. And I think asking operators to go out and be an expert in a sewer line is an unfair yeah. ask. I think it's an unfair ask. The engineer, the public works director, they should know how that sewer line operates because once the wastewater comes into the plant, operator's responsibility and if you look at the state level they do not hold i mean they'll talk to the operator about lines and things like that but at the end of the day it, it, it's a real thing and I, I think that's where private contractors get into trouble versus an employee the, the other challenge is that contractors that's not just their one wastewater right there might be the operator in charge for like 13 different systems and yeah. to understand 13 different systems, I mean, let's think about it this way, right? Elon Musk runs five different companies. Five. Now, imagine being the expert at 10. Be, be too much, right? It'd be too right. much. And so when somebody is the master at their craft of what they do as an operator in that system, I think you naturally get a better experience because that person's sole focus is that system. They know it. They have time to go out on the exercising of the valves. They have time to go look at every knickknack and every cranny and everything else at the wastewater treatment plant or the water treatment plant. They have time to spend in the meetings and everything else. That contractor is like, Yep, I'm here for an hour. I got to check my systems and I got to go to the system up the street. I think holding them, expecting that you're going to get the same level of service, I, I just, I, I think it's unrealistic. So what I hear is it really, as you mentioned earlier, it, it really comes down to the TAN manager, the CEO who's overseeing that to really have a good concept, holding people accountable, a good plan in place for how they're managing the infrastructure replacements. And then the people running, actually running that stuff on a day-to-day. -day. Yeah. 
I mean, 100 percent, because they're the ones that CEO position is also the person who's in charge of finance. It, asking an operator to even understand the finance. It's out of their lane. It is. That's not what they're trained to do. They're just, I need a valve. I don't know how much it costs. Ask me to run the system. Ask me about the data of the system. I got gotcha. you. Ask me about the finance of it. Eh, I'm not really sure. Like, and that kind of brings me, when I had a conversation with your coworker, that brings me to like the way the town of Hayden actually finances public infrastructure. So unlike a lot of places, we do not run capital investment of water sewer infrastructure. We do not run that through our water sewer fund. That was like a foreign concept to your, well, not foreign concept, but your coworker, when I spoke with him, he was like, wait a minute, like, you don't, you don't run the capital finance through the water and sewer fund? I said, nope. We run it through a capital improvement fund. And the reason we do that, this is in Colorado, right? We do that primarily for a couple different reasons, but the main one is Tabor and its impact on enterprise funds. So if I have a project and it's like a, in small towns, you cobble financing together from a lot of different places. So you go to Dola and you ask for, you know, $750,000 and then you have your match, but that match might come from a couple different funds. It might come from the enterprise fund or whatever. I think enterprise funds really should be about the operations of the system because that's how you can truly measure day-to-day -day employee costs, the operations of the system and you can measure it accurately. You start throwing capital in there and you're like, oh, well, you know, and my fees is accounting for. So you have fees that should be building up a reserve for capital, but then Tabor, it's say you need some money from your general fund or say you need some money from the federal government and they're only gonna allow you to use 10% of your general fund or whatever to go into the enterprise fund. But if you use a capital improvement fund, there's no restriction. So I could transfer as much as I wanted from my general fund to my capital improvement fund for that water asset that I'm going to build. And then the enterprise fund accepts it as an asset and then operates it. So, in so late, can I take that back to yeah. layman's term here? It would be like your dad buying a house and just able to give it to you tax free or some extent like that. Like someone in your family has an asset, they're able to acquire, or part of the family can acquire it and transfer it over to you. And it's it's a lot cleaner process. Is that kind of my closer there? It's, no, it's less, but maybe in layman's terms, small local governments need to have as little restriction about how to finance capital assets as possible. So by eliminating capital in the enterprise fund, you are eliminating some pretty restrictive financing rules oh. that you have to abide by in your audit yeah. and all this other stuff <clears throat> versus just funding it into the capital improvement fund. And the rules say that an enterprise fund can transfer out money for a project <clears throat> as long as it's a water or a sewer project. So my capital improvement fund has the water project Enterprise fund contributes 60,000. The general fund contributes 200,000. That's my match for the $600,000 project. Understood, that makes sense. Yeah, but I can tell you, if you go across most special districts, most municipalities, small ones especially, they run their capital through, they run it through the enterprise fund. And that makes sense. And so what you're trying to do is eliminate that asset acquiring and like where the source of money can come from and it goes in that capital improvement understood because I, I actually i've heard exact i've heard time and time again the opposite or what you're saying not to do that's what they're doing and so that's very interesting i didn't realize that either yeah it's like for example if you go to the state revolving loan fund you're going to ask for that money <clears throat> you're going to build the project and they're going to say, well, only 10% of that can come from your enterprise fund because of Tabor restrictions. But I can transfer 10% and I can transfer this other thing. But if I run it through my capital improvement fund, there's like, oh, cool. 
Thanks. Where can someone get more educated on that pro? Like, where did you learn that process? Did you develop it? If someone were trying to kind of get their head around that, I worked for a. I when I was in the special district world, I worked for a finance firm. I had a bunch of accountants that were around me all the time that <clears throat> were hired for these special districts. And they were hired to be, you know, run the finance and everything else. And it just kind of like dawned on me one day when we were doing capital improvement because somebody was like, God, these table restrictions. And I just, you know, it's really hard. And, you know, it limits our grants that you can go after because like there's a bunch of federal grants out there. And they're like, oh, well, we can't do that because of these federal re these requirements from Tabor and federal money and all this other stuff that the state puts on us. And I was like, and one time a board member asked me, well, how can we get around that? And I was like, I don't know, let me go check. And I didn't know. And I was like, huh, maybe we'll just do it this way. And accounts cleared it, attorney cleared it, everything else. And I went, there you go. Like, it was just a- It's board. the right question has to be asked. <laughs> the right question in education, right? Just like maybe right. this will help some folks or, you know, whatever. But I mean, I would highly advise any small municipality will open up themselves up to a plethora of financing that may not have been available for water wastewater if they just simply have a capital improvement fund and run it. It takes extra accounting. That's the chick. And sometimes that's hard for people, but it takes it, it takes a level of sophistication in accounting to have this other fund over here to make sure it's only capital to make sure where your sources of funding come from. And when it comes in, you have to be able to allocate it and you have to do all of those things. And so that's that's that level back to the finance CEO thing. That's what you gotta have. I think that's why it's so important to have professional management outside of operators. I love that because if you think about a CEO, they're kind of, they a lot of them have a great financial background. Like they understand finances and accounting measures, but then they also have the people and operation skills. They kind of have like enough from each category to understand right. just how to pull it all together. Right. And I worked 10, you know, close to 10 years, Clifton Larson Allen, which is like a huge accounting firm. And, but the category, you know, the, the department I worked in and I spent like just a lot of time in finance. And so I get to the town of Hayden and I understand bond issues. I understand finance. I understand, you know, those types of things because I've been a part of a hundred plus bond issues. I've been a part of proving, you know, 15 to 16 budgets a year and blah, blah, blah. And they were all different and they were all so in that sense with your operators, like from municipality to hire an operator from the private sector, that might be a great thing because they have a diversity of experience with different systems and then they could hone in their craft on just one. From all the experiences they've seen, they yeah. can quickly, they have a ton of problems that they've solved or situations they've seen. That, yeah, that, but that's the one thing with a special district. If you're hiring a private contractor, they have a depth of experience. So like maybe that operator can't handle it, but they can call their boss and the boss be like, oh yeah, I remember we did that, fix it this way. So that's the, the depth of the bench that you get. If my employee, my operator is sick, right? I have a backup because we have two people have the same things, but most municipalities or most places, they have one. That person gets sick. They go yeah. without an operator for a while. And you can only go for so long. The state will only allow you to operate without an operator on site for so long. Oh, that was, that was really insightful. I guess qu quickly hitting, going to that CIP fund, how, like you guys talked about opening yourself up for grants and funding. How have you, the town of Hayden, kind of gone about making the best use of, of that fund? So over the last seven years, we have roughly funded in water and wastewater infrastructure from a grant perspective we have completed over $10 million in grant funding over the last seven years in our water wastewater. And some of the projects were bigger, some of them were smaller, you know, that sort of thing, but over $10 million in improvements. And when we did our CIP in 2017, going into 2018, we had approximately like 
15 million dollars in needs within the next like six years and we had to come to grips with some of the stuff we were going to have to extend out some of the life expectancies like i talked about we were going to have to we were going to have to get more out of it so like we had to make decisions like oh we'll just maybe we can replace just this one thing and that'll give us three more years of life till we can fix this other thing and then we can get to this thing and then we can get to that thing and everything else and then you know we went to the voters and said gosh we have all these needs we've never asked your rates to go up we're going to increase rates by a lot but we're also going to pass this bond issue to really tackle these things as well and and we were able to you know the voters were good enough to approve it and so then we went out and and then we used that voter approved money and we leveraged it and we went to the state and we said look you know we've got two million two point two million dollars in water wastewater money we oh. need all this other money and the state was like great you got the match we can make it happen you've got the management you've got the you know and because the state does want to see that you can manage a project successfully yep. and they want to know that their investment is being spent wisely so that's that's awesome that's what we've done and uh, we continue to you know it's um a perfect and i think the last part is that that ceo position they can see past because i'll get this all the time like i'll see a grant opportunity like we saw one today for climate resilience and it was coming through the colorado energy office but water wastewater entities who own a system were eligible to apply and it was about reducing your carbon footprint and i went hey i know a bunch of systems in my wastewater treatment plant that need improvement they need new systems they need new more equipment. efficient pump whatever more yeah. efficient pump whatever and i went if i improve those to reduce my carbon footprint which we take very seriously at the town of Haiti, like we take that re climate change and everything else we take that very very seriously and our footprint on the environment we also take very seriously so i went i sent it to our public works director i said hey maybe this could help us apply for this to improve these systems that you and i have been talking about in the cip an operator would look that big like, oh it's climate you know how am i going to do that whatever right I'm like you just design the system to improve the carbon footprint so that you can apply yeah that's all you got to do you got to think creatively about how to go get that money because if you don't that's great. and and that's you know and i god bless engineers and operators sometimes creativity when thinking about those things it's not their strong suit right their strong suits running things and designing things yes my job to point them in the right direction to say i think we can apply and here's why and here's how and then you know kevin our like we talked about our new project management specialist and oh you've got all this support to apply for this grant and everything else and then it comes together hopefully we'll that's see really cool that know that you uh, articulated that really really well that skill gosh I, I talked with david at round mountain and he had the same kind of thing i it was an energy efficiency grant where they had to make their wells more efficient they tied some solar panels to it but they got all new wells and them they, they redrilled and cleaned out and it was huge i think they they got 70 percent of it through grants so right. how many small towns have a road that needs replaced a lot right how many small towns have thought about the fact that their sewer line is in the middle of the road and if they rip up the middle of the road to get to that sewer line they have to replace the whole road as a result so the sewer funding and everything else associated associated improvements right they get a new road what other incidental how can you kind of find incidental things like the one causes the other like i have to fix the other because i'm fixing this one is kind of what you're saying so I mean, how can you get bang bang for your buck like double dip almost like how can i find solve two problems with one one thing well right well first of all obviously the actual water line probably does need replaced right it has to be replaceable it has to be but if here's how you do it pull out my cip and i go this line is going to be its life expectancy in the next 
two years. It's on the schedule for replacement and this year. And so I'm going to replace that line. Line might be OK. Line might actually have five, 10 years left of life expectancy, but my CIP standard says it should be replaced. So I, if that line, if I can use my CIP to justify the costs, any associated costs with dealing with it are just associated costs. Right. And you have to, you know, I can't, you could, I guess, patch a fourth of a mile section in the middle of the asphalt, but really you can't because then the road right. will just start to fail. Then you're going to dig it up anyway and everything else. So those are qualified associated improvements and we've never had an issue with that. I mean, you go to granting agencies, they get it. They're like, yeah, of yep. No, I'm, I love that. Yeah. But it's actually takes the thought process of going, of, of understanding what associated improvements actually come with replacing, yep. you know, a pump at the bottom of a well. Yes. You know? It's not just the pump, it's the piping attached to it. It's the crane that lifts it out. It could be the lid. It could... The electrical, right. uh, you know, all that stuff, all that activity that takes place getting that pump out of the ground, all the stuff associated with it. And, you know, and then and then I think the bottom line is that you have to be on top of managing your capital infrastructure and you have to be on top of knowing what condition it's in. You have to have photographic data, things like that. You have to take pictures. You have to mm -hmm. understand. You have to TV your lines. Because like, all that data, when we go to say, yep, that, what, that sewer line needs replaced, we can show that it has roots going through it and we can show that it is, you know, right. we've had backup over here and we can show because of, as a result of this and we've done all our normal maintenance. So guess what? It just is time to replace it. Yeah. Good data tracking, a good asset back, a good asset management, an asset management plan also kind of right. backed up with some photos, some great documents can go a long way when when it when the moment comes and the opportunity is there you've got it you're just plugging you're just plugging in which pieces you need for the opportunity the grants yeah and i mean you got to have a good engineer or a good in good you know we contract for engineering actually we're going out for rfp on engineering like friday uh for general engineering for the town it's all not just water waste water it has to be the whole package water sewer roads stored sewer the whole thing but you have to have a good, you know, you have to have a good team with you because I'm not an engineer. Like, sure, I've spent a lot of time in water wastewater, but at the end of the day, I'm not an engineer. And you need to be able to also speak to the fact that your engineers have certified that it'll work. It's the most efficient system that you can come up with. That sort of thing. You have to be prepared. Yes. Yeah, people like people that are prepared. And they don't like people that are not prepared. You know, Agree. Or that haven't done a rate study. Have you done a rate study with your water wastewater associated with your capital improvement plan? Have you done that? That's a question you see in every water wastewater grant. Have you done a capital improvement plan? Yes. Have you done a rate study? Uh, they're like, well, how does your capital improvement plan yeah. inform that? Because it's not. Without yeah, they, they not just come into the table with a, a, a deck of, your deck of cards and being ready to play. Like, it's yeah, it's so exactly. silly. So, all like, right. Matthew, thank you so much. That was a lot of information very quickly. Thank you for sharing your vast experience and knowledge on managing managing the town of Hayden and prior. Sure. No problem. Right. I hope it helps others. Yeah. So I think it will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very All much. Right. See ya.